the bridge between men and God. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The first and last great mystery of creation is its creator. Second to that mystery is the eternally asked question, from where did we come to live and where do we go when we die? This very simple question is quite easily answerable to the spiritually unfolded one who knows that which he cannot see. It has always been unanswerable to sense-dominated man, to whom the invisible universe, where God dwells and rules, has no meaning, for he has no knowing. He has no knowing beyond his sensing. There is a very definite bridge between God and man. It is invisible in the vacuum of the zero stillness of God's kingdom, but it has a visible link at every point where that bridge touches the shores of an action universe of motion. That is something which every man can understand, for he can hold the symbol of that great reality in his hand in the form of a simple seed. He has never known, however, that in the imperishable seed, within that perishable acorn which he holds in his hand, is the whole answer to where the oak tree comes from to live and where it goes when it dies. That is something which the physicists can more readily understand when you tell them him that the imperishable, invisible seed within that acorn is an inert gas or a combination of several octaves of inert gases. We again refer you back to figure 5. You will note that an inert gas, gas marked 0 begins and ends each octave. The nine inert gases are the shores of the visible universe where the invisible bridges which link mind and motion touch the moving action universe. There are nine of them because the bridge has nine parts, which we might call entrances to mortality and exits to immortality. Man has always thought of his periodic entrance into mortality as an entrance of his person, his being, his individuality into life. And he has always thought of his body exit into his eternally living self as death. That is the thought which has always been man's great enemy. That thought of death shall be destroyed by knowing that there is no death in nature to destroy. There is naught but eternal life in all this universe. There is naught but mind at rest and mind thinking in motion in all creation. Such a concept must gradually change as unfolding intelligence in man gives him higher knowledge of reality rather than its loyally believing rather than its lo loyally believed in simulation which motion produces. Eternal identity is never created. The ideal which man is is never created. It al always retains its dimensionless zero in the cathode of itself. That body which man thinks of as man is a moving light image which is projected from the, from the dimensionless point of man's eternal self. The projected light is mirage. It is a series of repetitions and reflections projected through invisible cube wave-filled mirrors. It has no more reality than cinema bodies have. It has no more knowledge or intelligence than they have. These bodies cannot even move of themselves, just as cinema bodies cannot move of themselves. Someday every man must realize that he is a mind only. What he now thinks of as himself is but mind thoughts electrically projected in two seemingly opposite directions in order to provide pressure mirrors of invisible light to act as screens for his light projections. He must learn that his body is but a formed, moving image of his mind imagining. Also, he must learn that there is no death in God's universe. There is naught but perpetual rebirth into an endless repetition of rebirths. 
every opposite of every pair is born and becomes its opposite sequentially. God's words, as given in his message of the Divine Iliad, expresses this thought in these words. Know thou then that I alone live, I do not die, but out of me comes both seeming life and death. Life is but the inward flow, thinking divided, pulsing, and death is the outward flow. Know thou also that the divisions, thinking, are but equal halves of one. For I again say that I am one, and that all things which come from me are one, divided to appear as two. It would be well to, um, to simplify our thinking as to what creation really is by putting it into simple words. Creation consists of the invisible universe of mind, which Jesus called heaven, and man calls space, and the visible universe of motion, which man calls matter and substance. There is a vast difference, however, in the meaning of the omnipresent heaven, which Jesus referred to as being within man and within all things, and the meaning of heaven which man holds as being a place up above and apart from the earth. For ages man has thought of heaven as a place above the earth where dead bodies and souls ascend. Literature and art are replete with symbolisms which very vividly portray pictures that that primitive concept. If we but enlarge our concept of the meaning of the word heaven to be that zero omnipresent vacuum which is everywhere within and without all things, as symbolized in figure six, then the ages long ideal that we go to heaven when we die is literally true. Then the ages when okay this, the uh, difficult thing for man to imagine, however, is the fact that he returns to heaven non-dimensionally, just as the dimensional oak withdraws its huge dimensions into ultra-microscopic nothingness. That is man's difficulty. If he would but realize that his body is but the projected image of an ideal, and that ideal has no measure, it would help him. We must bear in mind that the primitive pagan ideal was that the earth was all of creation. Man then thought of heaven as surrounding the earth. Heaven even had a limitation with holes punched in its boundaries for stars. Pagan man had no conception of limitless space and billions of suns and earths. He thought locally. Even his God was for this earth alone, and even for certain races alone. The Greek gods were man-formed and had human emotions and desires. That pagan man-formed god still persists, a god made in the image of man, a god with arms and legs for which he has no use in a limited zero expanse, a god who could be angry and wrathful with humans, who could not possibly be omnipresent, because of his objective limits. The time must come when man stops praying to a God up there in heaven, outside of himself, and talk to God within himself. The day of the brotherhood of man, with peace on earth and ecstasy in the heart of man, will never come until man awakens to his awareness of his own divinity and finds God in the light of mind which he himself is. May that day be soon for the many who are ready, and may they hasten the day for the still pagan-minded by awakening the light within them. We must become more familiar with the office, purpose, and construction of the inert gases in order to have a more definite knowledge as to our immortal identity in that omnipresent heaven. To acquire that knowledge and comprehension, the very first step toward it it's, is full comprehension of the invisible bridge between heaven and earth and the visible entrances and exits to it through the nine inert gases. Full comprehension of the interrelation of figures six and seven is a necessary 
prerequisite to comprehension of further stages of God's ways and processes in this respect. Next in import is to become thoroughly familiar with the nine-stringed instrument upon which the sympathy of symphony of creation is perpetually being played. Figure 5 has been prepared for just that purpose. At the beginning and end of each string is an inert gas. Each inert gas is constructed by four rings in one plane, centered by a hole which is the invisible mind source of those four rings. At the very center of that hole is a point of stillness, within which is lodged all of the life, energy, knowledge, ideal, and other qualities which are a part of the God nature in non-denominational qualities. No, in non-dimensional qualities. Let me read that again. At the very center of that hole is a point of stillness within which is lodged all of the life, energy, knowledge, ideal, and other qualities which are a part of the God nature in non-dimensional qualities. Every point in all the universe is like that point, but we are concerned with but one of them now, for that is the point where the oak tree draws its power to express the oak tree idea in form, or which any other unit of creation has chosen to draw its identity and power. That omnipotent point from which you have issued your body is the same point at which the visible mortal you become mortal you becomes invisible and again assumes immortality that one point in all this universe controls your every movement from your first one many millions of years ago to the last one which consummates the idea of man as expressed by you that one point is your soul of the universal soul it is your mind of the universal mind as one unit of creation. You are one with that mind. In fact, you are that mind. Your body is the thinking and imagining of that mind. The eternal you is that center, and your eternal body is that series of four rings of fluorescent light, which is eternally wrapped around that centering soul of the eternal you. Those four rings are eternal records of you. They are as immortal as you are immortal. They are the microfilm of you yourself. Do you begin to grasp the stupendous significance of that ideal? If you do grasp it, you have become aware that neither you nor your body can die. For that eternal microfilm of you will forever be projected into three-dimensional enlargement after every rest period between action and action. If you really do comprehend it, you now know that your mind cannot die, for your mind is one with God's mind, and that cannot die. Likewise, your body cannot die, for it is mind thinking, and the record of mind thinking is enfolding, enfolded forever within its soul seed and recorded upon those four rings which surround it exactly as a Beethoven symphony is recorded upon the rings of a phonograph disc. You are eternal, but your body is eternally repetitive. Your mind never sleeps, for it is changeless, but your mind thinking rests from mind thinking in cyclic intervals between its pulsations. Your body thus sleeps every night and becomes unaware of body existence. It must do so for it needs replacement and repair. You are quite familiar with that effect. It is quite understandable to you because of its oft-repeated occurrence. For the very simple reason of your newness of unfolding intelligence as man, you have not yet grasp the idea that the end of a body cycle, where the body has completely worn out, or where its growth has been short-circuited by a disease, or a bullet, or from falling over a cliff, is just another interval of sleep and body replacement by light projection 
from its seed records. The fact that you do not yet understand, that fact you do not yet understand, but you will um, meditate upon it sufficiently to let the knowledge we are giving you sink deeply into your centering consciousness instead of holding it superficially in your senses. When you do fully understand this fact, you will then know that what you have made yourself to be is what you, yourself, have electrically recorded upon those four rings which surround your soul identity. Whatever is recorded on those rings is perpetually being reenacted by you every second of the day. If you look into the mirror, you will see what kind of person you have made yourself become today because of your thinking and your acting a million years ago. You are the kind of person you have desired to be. You are the sum total of your own desires. Now look at some person who is infinite, who is an infinitely greater soul than you. What is the difference between each of you? Is It is a difference in desire only. If a greater one than you inspires you to be like him and you desire to be like him, you can be by recording that desire upon your soul record as a mental image. And that image of your mind desire will be projected back to you and make you like unto it. Let us look, let us again look into this new deep well of mind thinking and consider that you are ill of body because you have made it so by desiring to make it so. If you will but realize that you are recording the pattern of defective thinking upon your soul record as well as right thinking and desire instead of the pattern. Wait a minute. Let's start that again. Let us again look into this new deep well of mind thinking and consider that you are ill of body because you have made it so by desiring to make it so. If you will but realize that you are recording the pattern of defective thinking upon your soul record as well as right thinking and desire instead that the normal recordings of long ages of building a normal body will re-give you a normal body. Now, if you will but let it, your illness will be voided and replaced with normalcy of the light image of your ages-long building of your identity. If you will but look again at figure six and realize that the omnipresent, omnipotent, and omnipotent mind of the invisible God light therein symbolized has absolute rule over the projected light of his thinking as symbolized in figure seven, you will more readily comprehend how it is that the invisible, omnipotent, omnipotent you can and do Project balanced or unbalanced conditions to your body from yourself to create yourself in your own image. All things created by God are created in His own image. Therefore, God's creations are balanced. As you slowly arrive to the point where you know and feel God's presence within you, your creations will have in them the balance and masterliness of God's creations in the measure of that awareness. What is true of you is true of a whole generation. Man in the mass is not yet aware of the presence of God within him, and that is why this civilization is being built in man's image, not God's. This idea is clearly expressed in the message of the divine Iliad in the following words. For I say that man who senses but clay of each of him is bound to earth as clayed image of earth. Clayed images of my imagining who know not me in them are but dwellers of earth's dark. To sense man, the doors of my kingdom are self-barred by darkness until the light of me in him is known by him as me. Until then, he is but moving clay, manifesting not me in him, while sensing not but moving clay of him, knowing not the glory of my light in him. Wherefore I say to thee, 
Exalt thou thyself beyond thy sensing. Know me as fulcrum of thy thinking. Be me as deep well of thy knowing.